recording. So I think the question is, uh, you have to design a cylinder uh, and it's connecting rod assembly. And it says uh, design using the double quarter joint. There is an example in the textbook where you have the connecting rod and piston or crosshead and piston assembly, uh, but they, they are using the single quarter joint. Now, so again, I want to clarify what does it mean? So first and foremost, <clears throat> please understand the application. The application is we have a steam engine. We have a steam engine. And this steam engine usually will have an inlet valve and an exhaust valve. So steam engine would have an inlet valve and an exhaust valve. So unlike internal combustion engine, there is no articulation at the connecting rod. So this connecting rod and this piston, they are one solid piece. So anyways, what we need to do is, we need to convert this reciprocating motion of the piston into rotary motion of the crank. So we need to take this reciprocating motion and convert that into the rotary motion of the crank. And there is something called as the crosshead. So how does crosshead look like? So crosshead would look something like this. So it's a sliding uh, sort of member. So crosshead slides back and forth. One side of the crosshead is attached to the piston and the other side of the crosshead, it attached to the crank. So this is how this assembly looks like. And here there is a pin. So now you can observe that one. You should be able to hear me now. Yep, we're back. We hear you now. So please, please mute yourself and understand I'm co-host. Don't mute me. So, so as you can see, my iPad is, I'm talking on my iPad. So I'm a co-host. So please don't mute me. Just mute yourself. No, anyway. So. I want you to look at, this is the piston. And this is the cross head. This is the cross head. And 
and the crosshead would slide back and forth between the rails. Now, what we want to do is we want to attach piston to the crosshead. Now, a single quarter joint is very good if this is very important. Single quarter joint is a very good application if uh, the spigot is part of the piston piston and the socket is part of the crosshead. So you have a spigot on one side and you have a socket on the other side. But please try to understand not all the quarter, not all the crossheads can come with a socket. So in certain cases, what you can do is you can think about adding a sleeve, adding a sleeve and putting one quarter here and putting another quarter here. So what happens is there are both designs are possible. If you have a crosshead that is integrated with some sort of a socket, then you can use a single quarter joint. That design is acceptable. If your socket, I mean, if, if you don't want to use a socket, if the crosshead just comes with a rod, not the socket, just with the rod, then I would use a double quarter joint. Now, what is the advantage of double quarter joint? Even though it is not mentioned, double quarter joint would allow you to attach <clears throat> two rods with different diameters. So for an example, you can have a diameter on the piston, which is slightly smaller or greater than the diameter of the rod, which is on the crosshead. So that is the advantage of the, the double quarter joint. Now, some of you may ask me, so what should we design? in the homework, what should we design in the homework? Now you have options. So this is a design course. You have option. You can choose to say that, hey, I'm gonna use a single quarter joint and then design a single quarter joint, which would be exactly similar to the one problem that is solved in the textbook. Or you can be a little bit more creative and say, I'm gonna use a double quarter joint and then follow the technique that is discussed in the for the double quarter joint. The only difference in double quarter joint, the design is easier because you don't have collar. So it's just a sleeve. Does it, does it make sense? Yes. Also, and again, there is, I, I shouldn't say that does not have sleeve. I have seen double quarter joints with sleeves. So for an example, there is no one has prevented us from designing a sleeve, something like this. And I have seen this in industry. So basically in double quarter joint, what you have is you have sleeves on either side and then you get quarter here and you get quarter here. So just that's not given in the textbook that does not mean sleeve does not exist. Sometimes you would see the design where you would have a sleeve with, with collar. So that's totally fine, which is something like uh, if you design like single quarter joint on either side. Any other questions that I can answer? Online students? Okay. So has anyone looked at the next quiz or the homework? Yeah, what is it? It's design of knuckle joint, right? Okay, and what after the, what is the homework after knuckle joint? Turnbuckle, so we are done with turnbuckle. And uh, what is the homework after that? Oh, you can on your own, you can finish the course as soon as you can. So, so don't, don't just wait for me. Shaft and flange design for a diesel engine. Okay, so as you can see that we are done with flange coupling design. So <laughs> nobody has, nobody is preventing you to go all the way up to the homework, I think too. 
Okay, what after that? All right, so power screws, right? Okay, so let me start with power screws. So in today's class, we are going to talk about power screws. Now, we talked about the turnbuckle. Turnbuckle is a screw and nut assembly, but it's stationary. It is not used for power transmission. On the other hand, if you look at the power screw, probably you have seen this. I don't know, have you seen the, the, the desks like this, or maybe uh, uh, stools or something like, or jacks, screw jacks, something like this. So wherein what you have is you have a screw over here and you have the nut over here. And what you do is by rotating the screw, by rotating the screw, you can either lower or raise the height. So in one orientation, if you rotate in one direction, the platform goes up. If you rotate in another direction, the platform goes down. Now I want to ask you if you have seen mechanism like this. So in certain cases, the platform actually goes down on its own. So for an example, here is what you do. You rotate the platform and hold it at one place. As soon as you remove your hands, as soon as you let go, the platform on its own goes down. Have you seen something like this? In certain cases, you rotate and you let, uh, you, you, at, you actually raise the platform to certain height and remove the hands, the platform stays where it is. So there are two possible options. One is, self-locking and second one is non-self-locking. What do we mean by self-locking? Self-locking means you raise the platform, remove the hands or let it go. It stays where it is. In non-self-locking, as soon as you remove the hands, the platform would go on down on its own. Now, both of these screw jacks, both of these have their own different application. But the fundamental principle of screw jack is based on friction. Fundamental, so friction that you studied in, I think, uh, EGR 214 or 2617. That is the fundamental uh, uh, driving principle behind screw jacks. So let's, let's do this thought exercise. So say you have this mass on this platform. The coefficient of friction is mu. So the weight of the mass is M times G. So you have a downward force. The frictional force is mu times mg. Now, I know you know about friction, but I want to emphasize how is this friction going to play a role? So what I do is I pull this as long as my force is less than mu times mg. As long as my force is less than mu times mg, this block does not move. When this force F is equal to mu times mg, this block is on the verge of moving. It has not moved, but it can move anytime. And as soon as my force exceeds mu times mg, the block starts moving. So block moves. So what happens 
when the block starts moving. So if you write down the force is equal to mass times acceleration, please understand you have mu times mg going towards left. You have external force F going towards right and the acceleration is towards right. So M A. Now, when I apply Newton's law, summation of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And I'm gonna do this exercise just one time so that everyone understands. This is a vector equation. Force is a vector, which means it has uh, a scale, uh, it has a number or unit and the direction. Mass is a scalar quantity. So let's identify the coordinate system. This is my positive X, this is my positive Y. So let's first resolve the forces in the positive X direction. Can you see that I have positive F minus mu times mg, which is going towards the negative X direction is equal to M. M does not have any sign positive or negative multiplied by A. And can you see that my A direction is in the same direction as dotted line. So I got A. So what that means is this delta F is going to cause a positive acceleration going towards the right hand side. So everyone understood this? That is how the friction uh, would play a role. Now I want to make this problem slightly complicated and I want you to visualize this. Imagine same case that we have a platform, but this platform is now hinged. This platform is now hinged. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to change this orientation. I'm gonna change this angle. So initially the platform is at zero degrees, after some time, the platform may be at 10 degrees. After some time, platform 20 degrees. After some time, maybe platform 30 degrees and so on. Now, what do you expect to happen? I would expect initially when the platform is horizontal, we are not applying any external load. When the platform is horizontal, mass does not move. As I change the orientation of the platform, still mass does not move. But there is a critical angle theta beyond which the mass would be on the verge of moving. At that critical angle, the mass would be on the verge of moving. And if the angle exceeds that angle, the mass would start moving down on its own. Everyone understood this? I repeat this once again. Initially, mass will be stationary. Say from this angle to this angle. At this critical angle, it would be on the verge of moving. And beyond this, it will start moving. This angle, which is called as theta, that is critical angle, that is also called as the friction angle. Now, this is one interesting question that gets asked in interviews, that something like this, and, and you will also notice this. So, I have two different materials. I don't know what the materials are. Maybe this is acrylic, this is uh, maybe uh, plastic or ABS. These two materials are in contact. I want to find out approximate coefficient of friction between these two components. I want to find out approximate. So I will try to demonstrate it over here. I want to find out approximate coefficient of friction. I want to find out approximate coefficient of friction between this uh, block and this surface. How would I do it? 
the simple answer, the engineering answer is, what you do is you place this block on this platform and slowly start rotating. Slowly start rotating. And at some point, this block will start sliding down on its own. You don't want block to slide quickly. You want that block to be sort of on the verge of, of sliding. So let me show you again. And you see at this angle, it started sliding. This is the friction angle. So tan of friction angle is the coefficient of friction. That is how you will find out coefficient of friction in the practical examples. Now, one thought exercise is if I add oil, what would you expect? If I add oil, you would expect the block would start sliding down at much lower angle, right? Because the coefficient of friction is going to be less than there was no oil. So online students, did you understand? I'm sorry, it's not able to zoom or focus properly, but the experiment that I'm trying to show here is So experiment I'm trying to show here is, is the block sliding down in. So with this, let's look at the math. And I'm sure you did something like this in your EGR 217 or 217, right? Okay. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna draw the free body diagram of this block. I'm gonna draw the free body diagram of this block, which is on the inclined surface. This angle, actually, let me, let me say this angle is alpha. Let me say this angle is alpha. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna find out, since this angle is alpha, the normal reaction will always be perpendicular to the surface. This is the normal reaction. However, weight would be something like this. This would be mg. This component is going to be mg sine theta, sine alpha. And this component is going to be mg cosine alpha. Do you agree with me? So you have mg sine alpha and mg cosine alpha. Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to change this angle. I'm going to change this angle and I'm gonna find out what happens to the frictional force. So the frictional force here is going to be mu times normal reaction, which is mg sine alpha. So what happens when alpha is equal to phi, which is the friction angle, mg sine alpha is equal to mu times mg uh, cosine alpha, this is cosine alpha, this is cosine alpha, g cosine alpha. So sine alpha divided by cosine alpha is equal to mu. So please note, when alpha is equal to phi, sine alpha is equal to sine phi, cosine alpha is equal to cosine phi, which gives you tan phi is equal to mu. So the point I'm trying to say here is, if your coefficient of friction is mu, the coefficient of friction is mu, so like mu is equal to 0 0.3. And what you do is, you find out tan inverse of mu. 
and then you'll find out the value of phi. If the platform, if alpha is less than phi, alpha, if alpha is less than phi, the screw is self-locking. It means mass does not move. If alpha is greater than C, it is non self locking. So mass goes down, moves due to gravity. So I want you to think about this thought exercise. A screw jack is basically, it's a helix. So I want to show you what is a screw jack. So you have, this is the screw. And the screw will look something like this. <clears throat> So if you look at from the back side, this is gonna look like, so there will be an angle here. So this angle is called as alpha. The alpha is called as the helix angle. And C is the coefficient of friction. So if you think about it, if you have a nut here, and depending upon the material of the nut, it could be a brass nut, it could be the steel nut, it could be uh, a mild steel nut, cast iron nut. So this will be tan inverse of mu. And this mu is dependent on the type of lubrication you have. Sometimes you have oil lubrication. Sometimes you have grease. Sometimes you have some sort of synthetic lubricant. So depending upon the lubrication between the contacting surfaces, the value of mu could be different. So when is screw self-locking? Screw is self-locking when the value of alpha is less than value of C. Screw is not self-locking when the value of alpha is greater than value of phi. In other words, think about that this helix angle is very steep. It's, it's quite high helix angle. Everyone understood this? So how do you find out this helix angle? So if you think about helix angle, what is a helix? Helix is, suppose if you have an ant, then if this ant tries to walk on this circumference, then one revolution, basically it will go up by some amount. That amount is called as uh, the pitch. So basically the distance between two successive threads is called as the pitch value. Now there is a, so, there is a concept which is called as the lead. Lead is nothing but number of starts multiplied by pitch. So sometimes you can have a single start screw. Sometimes you can have a multi start screw. So you can have a single start screw in the case of single start screw, one revolution of the screw advances the nut by one pitch distance. So you rotate the screw by 360 degrees and the nut would travel by one pitch distance. That is the single start screw. Sometimes the screw could be a multi start screw, which means you can have two or more starts. So in one revolution of the screw, nut would advance two times the pitch or three times the pitch. 
that is called as the lead so lead is the amount of travel amount of nut travel in one single revolution of the the screw is the lead and where do you use single start screws single start screws are used where you want more precision uh, multi start screws are used when you want speed say for an example in one you have in one revolution of the motor you want the nut to advance three times four times or you want it to go quicker then you can use the multi start screw sometimes you could just have screw and nut assembly or you can have sometimes ball screws because the problem with the screw and nut assembly is coefficient of friction is still quite high for very precise applications you want to control that coefficient of friction so what you have is you have circulating balls so basically there are sort of small small uh, ball bearings small balls here they are part of the nut so as the nut is going up or down rather than having a surface contact there will be sort of a point contact between the balls and what happens because of that is coefficient of frictions coefficient of friction is significantly reduced because it's a rolling contact the, the coefficient of friction that's why some of the cncs the the hash or other cncs they don't have just the lead screws they have something called as ball screws that would minimize the power requirement that would minimize the friction that would minimize the heat but unfortunately it increases the cost so that is the advantage and disadvantage of the regular lead screw versus the ball screw now one one important thing is lead is equal to number of starts multiplied by pitch now i want you to find out the helix angle alpha how do you find out this helix angle if you think about naturally the way the helix angle is if you sort of wrap a thread around one single if you if you wrap a, a wire along the thread if you wrap a wire along the thread you would notice the if the length of the wire is one revolution in perimeter which means the length of the wire is pi times d you would have the advancement is equal to lead so think about what i do is i take this wire and stretch it this distance is going to be pi times the diameter of the screw now you may ask me what diameter is this because if you recollect in turn buckle we said there is something called as the core diameter and there is something called as the outside diameter so there is a core diameter and there is outside diameter this d it's called as the mean diameter which is do plus dc divided by 2 this is the mean diameter dm and this guy here is the lead so alpha which is the helix angle is equal to tan inverse of lead divided by pi times dm and it is very clear to note <clears throat> let me ask you this i have a single start screw and i have a double start screw i have a single start screw and i have a double start screw and i tell you everything is the same the diameters are the same the pitch is the same but one screw is single start one screw is double start and i ask you tell me out of these these two screws which one is self locking and which one is non self locking what would you answer so yeah go ahead 
start is going to be non stop blocking because since there's so there's like two threads, right? Correct. They have a higher angle to get to the same space between them. Correct. So it'll look down easier. Correct. So visualize the figure that you have on the right hand side. So think about if you have the same pitch, double starting, the rise is going to be higher. So basically the angle alpha is going to be higher in the case of double start screw. That's why most likely the double start screw is going to be the non self locking. Let me ask you this question. Okay. So you have a self-locking screw and a non-self-locking screw. The tricky question. So as we said, we have a double start screw that is non-self-locking, which means you add the load on its own, it goes down. What is the application for the non-self-locking screw? What is the application for non-self-locking screw? No, application. Application is clamping. So for an example, or press tools. So, so imagine that you have stack of sheets and you want these sheets to be clamped down all the time. So then you want that screw. So basically remove, remove the sheet, let go. The whole thing gets clamped. Other application is a press tool. Basically what you do is, so you have, if you have a blank, if you want to punch a blank, so you have the bare sheet metal, then what you do is you let the weight roll down, let the weight roll down and actually punch a hole that would save the power requirement. So basically rather than adding the force in punching, you use the self weight as means to punch a hole. So clamping, punching, those are the applications for non self locking screw. What is the application of self locking screw? What is the application of a self locking screw? Screw jack. So, work holding. So, if you want to raise the load, or if you want to hold a load, or if you want to use something like a lift or escalator, then you would use the non self locking now here comes the tricky question if i have a self locking screw if i have a self locking screw how would i convert a self locking screw into a non self locking screw you increase the friction lubricate it lubricate it heavily so that the self locking screw Will get converted into a non self locking screw. Okay, now here is the question I have a non self locking screw, but I want to convert that into a self locking screw. What do I do? You are not changing the geometry. Add grease, Add grease it will actually make it worse, right? So you have a non self locking, which means the screw is going down. But what I want is I want to actually prevent that screw from going down. Lock add a lock nut. You can either add a lock nut or you can add a set screw. And these are the tricks that are used. Because many a times as engineers, we don't have a lot of control in the environment that equipment will be used. For example, you design this beautiful, beautiful self-locking screw. And if that self-locking screw is used in an environment where there is oil splashing, water splashing, then as an engineer, you wanna just make sure that self-locking screw stays self-locking. So what you can do is you can add some sort of either a lock nut or you can add a set screw from here. And you have seen this. You can add a set screw over here that would ensure that the screw will stay where it is in that uh, static position. Everyone understood this? So these are small, small practical uh, tricks that engineers play. Because even though we design 
our components for certain application. We don't know if the user is going to use it exactly the way we intended. We don't know the environment where that is going to be used the way it is intended. We don't know if user would expect it to last for the operating time that we designed or it, that user expects it for much, much longer operation time. Yeah. Are other pins designed to so in quarter, so basically in theory, quarter joints, what you do is you hammer the quarter in. Oh no, no, no. I mean, I mean so in, a, in like a bolt nut, like as a castle nut, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, hole through the bolt. So it is quarter pane through and bends around the side. So right. Is that suicide? No. So basically, in theory, if you have a quarter pin, that is, okay. There are two important principles in design. This is like a side discussion. Some design components are designed for locating. So the purpose of the design component like dowel pins, it, you don't expect them to be load bearing members. You expect them to ensure alignment. The quarter pin in this example is, or the lock pin in this example, I don't know if you have seen that you uh, basically you have a circle clip and you add the circle clip and then you rotate it. So those are not supposed to be load bearing members. Those are supposed to be aligners. So basically you align. You add load bearing members that and that alignment, the load bearing members would take the load. So basically a very simple example is you have the nut, you have the bolt, and you want to add certain amount of clamping pressure. So that clamping pressure is handled by the nut. And what you do is you would see there would be an aligner hole through which you insert a pin, a circle clip or something and then split it. So that that pin would ensure that that alignment is maintained. And in that alignment, that amount of preload would be inserted by that nut. Classic example, if you work on cars, if you have, uh, I don't know if you work with CD joints or rear wheel drives. If you have a rear wheel drive, if you open the front axle, you would notice the bearings in the front axle are preloaded. The bearings in the, how are they preloaded? You actually, it's sort of a power screw, but you have a nut and then on the nut, basically you have a clip, you rotate it and adjust the clip so that clip locks the nut or prevents the nut from rotating and nut would ensure amount of preload that is required for that bearing to operate safely. So those are uh, some of, so, <clears throat> so there are some components for locating. There are some components for load bearing. There are some components that are used for guiding and some components that are used for loading and unloading, which means, <clears throat> for example, if you are going to design a, a fixture or a jig, wherein then you need to make sure that the component is properly located. Then you want to make sure the component is properly clamped. Then you want to make sure that the drill is properly guided. And then you want to make sure that you can take the component in and out of fixture without damaging the fixture or the component or the drill. So depending upon what you're trying to design, <clears throat> there are different design principles that are used in different component designs. So in this particular case, a screw jack could be used to transmit the motion. Screw jack can also be used to transmit the load bearing member. Screw jack can also be used to apply loads or sometimes achieve magnification. And this is actually, it's not typically seen this way, but I want to tell you something super, super important. And remember this, <clears throat> you know gears, right? So for an example, you have a gear. What does gear do? You have a big gear and you have a small pinion. You have, this is called as the big gear. And this is called as the pinion. Now, if I say gear ratio is one is to four, 
if gear ratio is 1 is to 4, which means one revolution of gear would make four revolutions of the pinion. Everyone understood this? One revolution of gear makes four revolutions of pinion. And there is power transmission. Power is energy. Energy can neither be created nor be destroyed. Assuming we live in perfect world, no entropy, all the energy from the gear gets transmitted to pinion, from pinion gets transmitted back to gear. So which means there is no power loss. So what happens? You have torque Tg omega g, which is the power of the gear, which is same as the power of the pinion, which is torque of the pinion, speed of the pinion. Do you agree with me? So what it means is if the gear is rotating one revolution, the pinion is rotating four revolutions, then the torque, then when a torque is transmitted from gear to pinion, the torque will have four times reduction, which means if the torque on the gear is one Newton per meter, then you would have four times reduction because as you can see, so speed of the gear is low. Speed of the pinion is high, which means the torque of the pinion has to be low and the torque of the gear has to be high. Everyone understood this? So this product is going to remain the same. If you increase the speed, torque has to go down. If you decrease the speed, torque has to go up. Everyone understood this? What is the problem with gear and pinion type of assembly? The issue with this is as you require higher power uh, or higher speed reduction or higher torque amplification, the size becomes bigger. So for an example, if I want one is to eight, one is to 20, one is to 50, can you see this small pinion would be like this and the big gear would be huge. So you can use planetary gear sets or you can use uh, maybe uh, gear trains. You can do all that stuff. But the question is, I can achieve the exact same thing using a power screw. I can achieve the exact same thing using the power screw. And even though power screws are not used traditionally for this application, they are used like, like this for torque amplification in variable robots all the time. All the variable robots that we built so far, if you were to use a gear mechanism to achieve the torque amplification, the gears would be bulky and too big and heavy. But you can use the same amplification using a power screw. And let me show you this, how it actually is achieved. So if you look at the power screw, what you have is, and remember this, this is actually super important. This is not given in the textbook. This is not the textbook application of power screw, but this is a very practical application of power screw. So you have this motor and to this motor, what you have is you have this uh, screw. On this screw, you have this nut. Okay, on this screw, you have this nut. So now think about it. In the perfect world, power from the motor gets transmitted to the power of the nut. So power from the motor gets transmitted to power from the nut. So what is the nut power? What is the power of the nut? The power of the nut is nut is going to go forward and backward. So it has a translational velocity. So I'm gonna call this force times the velocity of nut is equal to the power of the nut. Do you agree with me? Because power is what? Force times the velocity. However, 
on the motor what you have is the power is given as torque times angular velocity p multiplied by omega do you agree with me everyone understood this now here is what happens <clears throat> the motor could run at 1000 rpm 2000 rpm 3000 rpm motor can run at very very high speed okay motor can run at very very high speed but i can adjust i can adjust the force on the nut i can adjust the force on the nut by tuning the vn which is the forward velocity of the nut and what dictates the forward velocity of the nut the lead is i i can i will repeat this is not a, a, a concept because it is not discussed in the textbook so i just want to spend a, one more minute on this now whatever you what you can achieve with a gear and pinion you can achieve the same thing with a power screw the application is power is the product of two terms torque multiplied by speed torque multiplied by angular speed or force multiplied by the linear speed or linear velocity torque angular velocity force linear velocity now in the case of power screw i can manipulate i can manipulate the forward velocity of the nut and i can adjust Okay. Bear with me for a second. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. So, <clears throat> this can be used in and again you can play some tricks so so what is the trick that is used so you can actually use a lever arm here and if you use a lever arm something like this that you would get very very high power transfer a very very high gear ratio which means a tiny tiny motor would be a lot you can lift significant significant amount of weight so uh i don't know if you have seen this this is the design that is used in a uh, uh, miniature screw jacks uh, if you go on amazon uh, you will see that there are miniature screw jacks very tiny tiny small package wherein what you have is you have a motor attached to the nut you have a lever arm that is used for force amplification and then you can actually load tiny tiny screw jacks can lift that entire vehicle so basically that is how we play with 
power transmission. So teeny tiny amount of uh, the only thing is the motor there is going to rotate at 6,000, 8,000 RPM very, very fast. But still, you can achieve the, the amplification. Okay. That brings me to next question. How do we find out the, the, the amount of torque that is needed to raise the load? So for an example, if you have a screw jack, if you have a screw jack, here there is nut, and then there is screw. And if there is load W, the question is how much amount of torque that you need to apply? How much amount of torque that you need to apply to raise this load? So think about that we have a platform, you have a load. So how much torque you should apply? And for that, with a very simple equation is torque is equal to W dm by 2 multiplied by tan of alpha plus phi, where alpha is the helix angle and phi is the friction angle. And how do you find out alpha? Alpha is equal to tan inverse of number of starts multiplied by the pitch divided by pi times dm. So number of starts, if it's a single start, it's one. If it's multi starts, it's two. Pitch value will be given to you divided by pi times dm. Now, the next thing which I want to briefly talk about is what are the different configurations of the screw jack? A very simple screw jack is shown on sort of this is table jack. So you basically use that to raise or lower. Another application is you can have a scissor jack. And this probably you have seen in automotive applications. So this is like combination of turnbuckle and screw jack. So basically you have left hand screw on one side, you have the right hand screw on one side, and you have this base. And then you have this top platform. And what you do is you rotate screw in clockwise direction. The platform goes up, you rotate the screw in counterclockwise direction, the platform goes down. So you could have a scissor jack. Have you seen this scissor jack? Typically used in cars when you want to change the tire. Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna actually take a couple of simple examples in today's class. And in next class, we will start with the actual screw jack design. So let's say, let me see the first problem. So a two start screw with a 80 millimeter OD and 14 millimeter pitch supports 1.5 kilo Newton load. So find torque needed to support the load. So what we have is, we have <clears throat> outside diameter, the pitch is given. So there is one empirical relationship, which is D outside minus D inside is equal to pitch. 
So outside diameter is 80 millimeter. Inside diameter is equal to 14. So D inside is equal to 66 millimeters. DM is equal to 80 plus 66 divided by 2, which is 73 millimeter. The next thing what we have to do is we have to find out the helix angle alpha is tan inverse of number of starts multiplied by pitch divided by pi times dm. So tan inverse, number of starts, q, pitch, 14, pi, dm is 73. And you can find out the value of alpha. And I think that value of alpha is 7.3, uh, seven, 7 degrees, 7 degrees. Now here, the coefficient of friction is not given, but if you look at the design data book for particular application, the coefficient of friction would be given to you. So if you look at the design data book or the table that is given in the textbook, you can find out the coefficient of friction can be somewhere between 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. So range for mu, Zero point one to zero point two. Now, some of you may ask me, why is this range given? Now, the ra this range is given because we don't want that screw to be super hard to operate. We do, and or we don't want that screw to be super easy. We want certain value of friction. So, how would you maintain this particular value? It completely depends upon the application. It also depends upon the temperature. It also depends upon the use. If it is intermittent, continuous, it is also depends upon the overload. So you can actually design, you can add some design specs on the, the screw and operation specs on the screws that would ensure that coefficient of friction between 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. So I'm gonna assume mu, is equal to 0 0.15. So value of phi will be tan inverse of 0 0.15. And that gives me about 8.5 degrees. Now, please note, alpha value is less than the value of mu. So this screw is, this screw is self-locking or non-self-locking. Alpha value is great, less than the value of phi. So it is self-locking. So value of torque is W times dm by two times tan of phi plus theta. So substitute these values, <clears throat> 1.5, 72 divided by 2 times tan 7 plus 0.5. And I think the answer is 0 0.03 kilo Newton meter. So <clears throat> this is how you would solve a problem. I have time to solve one more problem, but before I go uh, further, let me see, are there any questions related to screw design? Yeah. C plus alpha, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. C plus alpha. Now, if you really want to be a hardcore 
then there is something else that happens. I don't know if you observe this, but the amount of torque that is needed to raise the load is different than the amount of torque which is needed to lower the load. I, I, I want you to, okay, I just want you to visualize. Imagine you have a screw jack and the screw jack is self-locking. Screw jack is self-locking. Now you want to raise the load. If you want to raise the load, then you apply certain amount of torque. Now my question to you is, if you want to lower the load, would you apply the same amount of torque, more torque or less, or less torque? It would be less torque. Why? Because the gravity would be assisting you. Everyone understood this? The gravity would be assisting you. Now, even though this is a good exercise from mechanics point of view, from the design point of view, we are always interested in the maximum value, bigger diameter, maximum size. So this is the maximum torque that is needed to raise the load. We know the torque to lower the load is it would be less than this. Everyone understood this? Yeah. How would you calculate if you want to lower? Minus. So basically, C minus alpha. Okay. Then uh, I don't have time to solve one more problem. Uh, but please try to understand this is the basic equation. There is nothing new. Remember the turn buckle? We talked about turn buckle. Remember the shear failure of the threads that we talked about in turn buckle? Remember the crushing failure of threads we talked about the turn buckle? We are going to combine those with this torque equation, and that becomes the design of speed. Once again, here we just found out the value of torque. Everyone understood this? This is the amount of torque that is needed to raise the load. But now remember in the turn buckle, we looked at the failure of threads. The failure of thread could be because of the crushing, or the failure of thread could be because of the shearing. So those two failure modes we have to check for our screw jack design. Now, one thing I want you to understand, and this is a little bit different, is imagine a case when the screw jack is utilized. You are raising the load or lowering the load. You are raising the load or lowering the load. Visualize. On that screw, on that screw, you are applying top. Do you agree with me? However, in addition to torque, there is load on that screw, which means you have torque and you have axial load. You have torque and you have axial load. Axial load gives you normal stresses. Axial load gives you normal stresses. Torque gives you shear stresses, which means now you have normal stresses and you have shear stresses. That will get you principal stresses. So, which means when we design the screw jack, we want to make sure that the screw jack is safe for the principal stresses. Everyone understood this? This is the overall view of the screw jack design. What I will do in next class is I will give you the step by step recipe for screw jack design. And then I will extend that discussion to the scissor jack design. And we should be done with uh, uh, design of power. Any questions from my online students? So do not wait for the deadlines. Just complete the homework in full speed or complete the quizzes in full speed. Some of those problems, I will tell, repeat again, some of those problems I have solved partially in the video lectures. I'm not going to tell you which video lectures, I want you to find out. I've solved those problems partially in the video lectures. Some problems, partial solutions are worked out on the PowerPoint slides. 
So as long as you review all the material, uh, you should be you should be good. So.